significant spouse, the investment of money in daycare, school, after school activities, the investment of time in one or another aspect of a child's life. All of this must be balanced against other investments one has in one's other children, one's career, in order to assess an overall yield for one's parental life. And I should note in passing uh, that Becker has formulas for this. Uh, that would be helpful for anyone. <laughs> Neither of these two figures, uh, the consumer or the entrepreneur, are exclusive to neoliberalism. They both appear well before its emergence in the 1970s and 1980s. What is new about these figures is not their existence, but rather their depth in structuring who we are. It would be hard to argue, for instance, that earlier in the 20th century, people saw themselves primarily as either consumers or entrepreneurs. The amount of consumer goods was still too limited, and their scope too narrow for the former, and the dominance of industrial production over finance would hinder the development of self-identities, the latter. People's sense of themselves lay more in their roles as producers, a role that intersects with, among other figures, Foucault's analysis of the normalized individual in discipline and punish. Although, of course, a full discussion of that would take us too far afield from current concerns. What has emerged over the past 30 or 40 years is a pair of figures that, we might say, lie on the near and the far side of production. On the near side, the entrepreneur invests without yet producing. On the far side, the consumer partakes without having had to produce. These are figures that I would argue are not outside of us. They define large swaths of who many of us are. We invest our time and energies in our careers with certain colleagues, right? and in those careers, by that investment, we hope for a certain return. We place our personal resources, when we are, quote, rational actors, in the activities that are most likely to give the greatest yield. Our competition with others does not so much concern what one or another of us has made or accomplished, but who has had the best return on what has been invested. On the other side of things, our model for the non-invested life is often consumption. We watch others perform their lives for us on plasma screen televisions, while eating foreign takeout food and sipping beer from the newest and latest microbrewery. And at those moments, when the picture is sharp, the food just so, and the beer cold, Life is what it is meant to be. There is, perhaps, no more starkly revealing place to see these figures in operation than in our relationships with others. Our professional relationships are often marked by the question of how to position ourselves relative to those who can do us some good. Our sexual relationships are periodically marked by the consumption of pleasure as the phenomenon of hooking up displays. Even many of our friendships are given a silent account of who has done what for whom when. It is not that these type of relationships have never happened, nor is it that they are entirely bad things. Sex for pleasure rather than simply procreation is surely a social advance. Rather, right, the point is twofold. First, these relationships are currently framed by two particular neoliberal orientations, that of investment and that of consumption. And inasmuch as we embody these orientations, we ourselves become the figures of neoliberalism. Second and related, to the extent that we embody these figures, we become not only the products, but also, and perhaps more disturbingly, the conduits of neoliberalism. There have always been connivers and pleasure seekers. What neoliberalism has brought us are entrepreneurs and consumers, not only in our economic lives, but in our lives in general. The suggestion I want to make here is that there are modes of friendship that can serve as forms of resistance to these two figures of neoliberalism. Otherwise put, there are friendships that can cut against what neoliberal, neoliberalism seeks to make of us. I can only gesture at the idea here, but its importance lies in this. Inasmuch as neoliberalism infiltrates our lives to make us its figures that in turn reinforce its own grip, we can use those lives to resist that infiltration and thus create alternatives to whom we are being asked to be. And that, I take it, is the contemporary force of Foucault's claim that society fears friendship as a way of life. We might begin by asking what is referred to in the idea of friendship. What is a friendship? And how does it differ from other forms of social relationships? For the goals of this paper, the distinction between friendship and other types of relationships is not crucial, since what I'm after is a particular type of friendship, or perhaps particular themes within the friendship. However, an initial definition will help point us on our way. I take this definition from Elizabeth Telfer's classic 1970 article, Pilots of New Friendship. She writes that, quote, 
There are three necessary conditions for friendship. Shared activities, the passions of friendship, and the acknowledgement of the fulfillment of the first two conditions, end quote. The first condition, that of shared activities, of course recalls Aristotle's view that friends share their lives together. This seems a fairly obvious criterion of friendship. It's hard to imagine using the term friendship among those who are not engaged in any kind of shared activities. One question that is worth reflecting upon, although why with the purpose of this paper, is whether contiguity in time and space is also necessary for a shared activity to ground friendship. In other words, can friendship be had partly or solely along virtual lines? It's not a question that tells fair things, but it is, I believe, a pressing question for us. The second condition of friendship, the passions of friendship, involve what Telfair calls an affection for the friend. More than that, however, she adds that affection is not necessarily rooted in the particular character of the friend. In other words, it's not the qualities of the friend that are the object of the passion in the affection of friendship, but the friend himself or herself. She adds, not disapproving, that, quote, friendship is in this sense irrational and because of this may survive radical changes in the character of its object. Thus, we can often continue to be fond of someone when we no longer like or respect them, and such a situation is not considered in any way odd, end quote. We will return to this purported irrationality in a moment, but I should note in passing that, as Telfair argues, it goes against the Aristotelian idea that true friendship can only be had among good people. The final condition of friendship is an acknowledgement of the first two conditions. That is, friendship does not simply involve a sharing and a passion, but some recognition that these are in place. Another term she uses for this acknowledgement is commitment. A friendship is based not on the happenstance of sharing and passion, one that seems no more than a stroke of good luck. Rather, it also involves what we might call a tending to, in the sense that one tends to one's garden. There is an awareness of the special relationship that friendship involves, one that calls one toward the other, as a matter not simply of passion or affection, but also of cognitive commitment. What Telfair has done is to isolate, among our personal relationships, a set that involves more than passing acquaintanceship or professional engagement. However, there's something else suggested in her view of friendship, something that may not, strictly speaking, be entailed by her definition, but would likely be a characteristic that would be hard to exclude from most relationships that meet her criteria. We may begin to isolate this characteristic by calling it other regard. That is to say, friendships, at least the ones that many of us admire, to one degree or another, seek the good of the other for the sake of the other, and not simply for one's own sake. This characteristic of friendship is one that Aristotle uses to distinguish true friendships from friendships of pleasure or utility. It's also found in other accounts of friendship. For instance, when Cicero writes, quote, we do not exercise kindness and generosity in order to, that we may put in a claim for gratitude. We do not make our feelings of affection into a business proposition. No, there is something in our nature that impels us to open and depart." End quote. In some friendships, there may be an orientation toward the friend that we might say pulls us off center of ourselves, allowing us to expend ourselves on behalf of the friend. So it's embarrassing. <laughs> I, I, I just thought it was the exclamation point on the Cicero. <laughs> it is not the decency or the nobility of this aspect of friendships that interests me. Rather, it's its non-economic character. There are things one does in the context of certain kinds of friendships that are done without calculation. They are done because they are called for, or because they are unexpected, or because they would be useful to the friend. We all know of actions like these, and of the contexts in which they occur. They are the compliments paid to a friend because he or she is momentarily vulnerable. The rides given because the friend's car is in the shop, or the friend is drunk, or because one is going that way anyway, and it would be just as easy. They are the hospital visits, the child care, the expertise shared, or the spontaneous gifts. These activities cut against the figures of neoliberalism. They are not simply investments performed with an eye to the return they will yield. And they are not simply enjoyments to be consumed. One may indeed enjoy doing them because they are for the friend. But this is not the same thing as the consumptive enjoyment promised by neoliberalism. 
It is a joy that arises from the knowledge of how it will affect the other, rather than solely how it feels to oneself. And this, I want to suggest, is one of the things that can make friendship threatening to the illiberal order. <coughs> it provides a model of relationships that cannot be subsumed under neoliberalism. It shows us that, right, in the words of contemporary activists, another world is possible. And it does so not by envisioning another world, but by pointing to its existence, already encrusted in this world. We can imagine what a world not dominated by the figures of neoliberalism would look like, because it sees already exist in some of the most significant relationships we have with others. And now, one might object that such a, relation cannot, such a relationship cannot exist. In fact, Jacques Derrida has done exactly that. There is no such thing in his view as a giving that lies beyond the economy of investment and return. He writes, quote, at the limit, the gift as gift ought not to appear as gift, either to the donee or the donor. It cannot be gift as gift, except by not being present as gift. The tech, can you, can't you just hear Derek? Right? <laughs> the, the temporalization of time always sets in motion the process of the destruction of the gift. Through keeping, restitution, reproduction, the anticipatory expectation or apprehension that grasps or comprehends in advance, end quote. The problem of placing the gift outside all economies, Derrida claims, is that it cannot be given without the knowledge that it is given, which brings with it the expectation of gratitude or return in the recipient, if not in the donor. I believe that in casting the matter this way, Derrida removes the gift from the context of friendship within which it arises. Thought of outside that context, a gift, whether physical or some other kind, a giving or offering to another, may seem caught within an economy of investment and return. However, in the parameters of certain kinds of friendships, this kind of giving can come to make sense. Friendship cannot develop in a, uh, an interpersonal realm in which the economy of gift uh, and return begins to lose its grip. My claim here is not that such friendships have nothing of the economic within them. If one person always gives and the other always receives, this puts a strain on the character of the friendship, at least as a friendship. However, there is a difference between thinking that a friend will look after one because that person is one's friend, and giving to the friend in a particular circumstance because that will foster one's friend looking after one. And from the other side, the gratitude one feels in receiving a friend's gift need not be the payment of a debt. It can be instead the joy of inhabiting a relationship that is not reducible to the economy of debts. The inhabiting of this kind of relationship, although it is not a payment of debts, is perhaps ironically rooted more in the past than relationships stemming from the figures of neoliberalism. This is not to say that all three temporal modes are not involved in any or all of these relationships. My claim is more specific. There is a certain way in which the consumer privileges the present and the investor the future while a friendship is rooted much more in the past, and the way it is rooted it resists precisely the economism of neoliberalism. The consumer's privileging of the present isn't difficult to grasp. Pleasure is a matter of current enjoyment. It is not so much concerned with what has happened or what is going to happen. To have pleasure is to be in the moment in a particular way. For consumers, that particular way of being